In this video, I will explain to you how you process your videos on your computer into a 3D model like this one. I will explain each and every step in a detailed tutorial so you can follow along. If you haven't seen my recent video where I explained all the process of filming, please go watch that first. So now after you loaded your videos onto your PC, it's time to start the preparing of the data. So there are two ways to do that. As a 3D scanning software, I'm using Agisoft Metashape. I think Agisoft Metashape is easy to learn, has a lot of automation and is easy to use. In addition, you can load a 30 day trial from their website. The only thing you have to do is go on help and do the activate product because otherwise you will not be able to export or save your 3D data. I invested the $179 into the standard license. You get lifelong updates to the newest version for free. Not sponsored again. Agisoft, you know what to do. So there are two possibilities to get our frames out of the video into our program because we will now take the video and get it into individual frames we can calculate with a photogrammetry software. One is to go to file, import, import video. So you can import your video you choose. I choose the second one here of this little guy and this window will open up. If this window isn't showing or you get an error message when you press on OK, you have to install a codec pack from Codec Guide. You find the link to it in the description. It's called K-Lite Codec Pack. The website looks a little sketchy, but it's actually what Agisoft Metashape tells you to do in that case. In here, you can preview your video to identify maybe videos that's blurry or where you lost track of your object. Our video looks quite good here. So we set our output folder wherever we want to have it. Um, let's do photogrammetry, do a new one and then it eagle. That's the name of this animal in German. Choose. And then we have to set how many frames we want to export. So here under frame step, we have to enter that. I want to get around 400 to 500 frames out of a two minute video. Because I know I have a frame rate of 60 frames per second, I can simply add together 60 plus 56, the one minute and the 56 seconds and times that by 60. So I have 6,960 frames. I want to have around 400, so I divide that by 400 and it says 17. So let's go a little higher. So let's export every 10th frame. All that, all that for nothing. That means that Agisoft imports one picture per every 0.2 seconds you took a video. So you get really small steps in your program. We can set a start and an end time if we like to. If we have, for example, some movement at the beginning, some movement at the end, we don't want to include in the video. We press OK and Agisoft will start to export the photos into your folder. Hey, Andy from the future here. So while you can do the process I just explained to you, I later found out that the result actually will be better if you use my second process with the free video to JPEG converter. So let's get back to the tutorial. If you don't want to use Agisoft Metashape for that purpose, I have another solution for you. The program is called Free Video to JPEG Converter. You can download it for free. What you do is simply go to your video, drag and drop it in here, and then it's basically the same thing. You set your output folder, you choose how many frames it's done. It has a lot of options. You can do all frames, you can do 10 frames out of the video, spaced the same way. You can do every one second or every 10th frame. And of course you can choose an even type there. So let's export every 10th frame, convert, and it will do the same thing. Put it in your output folder. Once the program is done with exporting, you mark all your photos and you simply drag and drop it down here. As you can see, we have 698 photos so far. So in here, if you double click on it, you can preview your photos. And as, if you can see, the movement in between individual photos is really small. What will help to determine the movement of the camera and the positioning and size of the object. A lot of information because 
you have a lot of angles. So, here you find your chunk. That's what she said! <laughs> In it, there are your cameras. It shows you that zero of all are aligned. You can see that by that NA. So the first thing we have to do, we go up here to workflow, we press align photo. We choose accuracy high. If your computer isn't that strong or if it fails on high, you can always choose medium and try it with that. You can do the camera position estimated, leave general pre-selection on, and then you set key and tie point limit to zero. What that does is it doesn't limit how many points on your pictures the software is allowed to compare with the next picture and the following ones. If you put a limit in here, it will choose the best, for example, 40,000 pictures. So if your computer is a little slow, put in here 40,000. We leave everything as shown here and press OK. It will now start to load all the pictures and look for points that he finds on both pictures. After that, he will start to compare the movement of the pictures to each other, like I explained earlier. You don't have to watch that now, because through the magic of editing... So what you see here now is all your photos arranged around your object. It basically shows you where it estimated your camera is. What you can do is go through there, check it, and look if you have to correct any cameras. Let us hide the cameras real quick to look at our point cloud. As you can see here now, uh, it shows 659 of 698 cameras aligned. So all these cameras were aligned. You ended up with a pretty good looking point cloud. So as you can see, you have like outline points out here. That's the surrounding. And you have your scan object here. The box indicates that it's already knowing where the part is where he has to focus. Of course, we have to clean that up. The working space basically defines where your object is. Just imagine it as a box you draw around your physical object. Because if I film a part, I don't want all the background. So I want my computation power to concentrate on just the part I wanted to print. Just think of it as a box around your part. But first, we want to make sure that all of our cameras are aligned. So we simply look for the not aligned camera. Scroll through, look for any N slash A. There it is. So you simply mark them, hold down shift, mark the last one, right click, align selected cameras. It will calculate, but it will be fairly quickly. And done. Okay. There we end up with our point cloud. So now we of course have to clean up our point cloud. We don't need all the surrounding points. So what we do, we go up here to the selection tool. I always use freeform selection and I basically mark as close as I am comfortable with around my part. When it's marked, it will of course mark the parts of my scanning part so we go to edit invert selection so everything outside of our model is marked simply press the delete key if you press spacebar you can toggle between your tool and the moving so we have a few points here so let's quickly get rid of those we can go a little bit rough here but the more effort you put into removing points you don't need, the better your scan results will be. So of course now we have like a little bit of these like outlier points I call them. Um, we can of course remove them like that, but there is a simple trick out there to automate that. You simply go to model, gradual selection, and there you choose the first option, reprojection error. In the reprojection error, you move the slider till you see that basically all points outside of your model are getting marked. So go in a little bit, look how comfortable you are with deleting those. You press OK, delete key, and it will delete all the marked points. The second thing I use under gradual selection is reconstruction uncertainty. Basically, how sure are you that the points here belong actually to the model. 
Are you sure? Yes. So we go up a little bit and try to get all the outliers. You see around the face where we have these rogue points, it marks a lot. Don't go too crazy on the first... Harley Quinn, nice to meet ya! ...run. You can always do multiple cycles of this. So a few of them you can leave, the program will ignore them. Only if you have really clouds of them. Like we have a few here, we have a few here. But these are like loan points. You don't have to get rid of those. Next thing we're gonna do is calculate our dense point cloud. So that's basically the camera estimation of where your camera has been while filming. So I toggled this switch on and now we can see all the pictures from all the direction that were taken. So we see we did a very good job at spacing it downwards. Of course, you always have less on top because you don't need the really top view. It's enough to have it here. But as you can see, the spacing in between pictures is pretty consistent and that's exactly why a, why a video is better than a photo. So next thing to do, workflow, build dense point cloud. The dense point cloud will actually be um, the base for your mesh. So we go to quality high, depth filtering, aggressive, I always take aggressive, and we say calculate point colors because it makes easier to build the texture. If it fails, try mild, and if your computer is slow, go medium. The high and aggressive will take a long time to calculate. In my case, it takes around 16 to 20 hours to calculate this step of the process. What the heck? Just leave your computer on, it will do the processing. You can even tell him to shut down after it's done, to save and shut down. So press OK. It will start importing all the points and all the cameras and positions and start to calculating the dense point cloud. But again, through the magic of editing. Now that we built our dense point cloud, we have a lot of information on our part. I know, it looks like it is a 3D model, but actually that's just loads and loads of points. Look at that. If your point cloud is looking like that, you know you have done a good job scanning. We actually have about 360,000 points in this point cloud alone. So next thing, workflow, build mesh. As the source data, take your dense cloud. Arbitrary 3D. And as a face count, I already always have 100 million in it, just to give it as much as it wants. Under advanced, I say interpolation enabled. What it basically will do is if you have somewhere a few points less, it will leave a hole. And if interpolation is enabled, it will fill that hole. Press OK and let it calculate. After the calculation is done, you will end up with something like that. It is a fully meshed part with basically no holes. Of course, the big one in the bottom we have to fill manually later and a little bit of a blurry texture. So that's just vertex colors. So actually your polygons itself, if we go to our view in wireframe, the polygons itself you can see here have colors. That's what this texture is made out of. So that's our polygon mesh. You see, we have a lot of polygons going on there. Let's go back to shaded. Now your 3D model already looks like a finished 3D object, but the textures are not final. Everything looks a little blurry. That's basically the camera or the program telling you how it will estimate that it will look like, but don't be worried. It will sharpen and the details will be much more crisp. Just build the texture. Let us do that now. Now we want to calculate our textures. Go to build textures, choose diffuse map, say images as a data source because the textures are high res there mapping method generic blending mode average and texture count and size you can choose so you can basically do 8000 pixels and i chose to do two separate pictures with 8000 pixels each it will take a time to calculate but the textures will be nicer and say enable hole filling press ok and let it calculate 
Now that our textures are rendered, it looks like a photo taken of the object, but it's actually 3D. After you've done calculation, uh, calculating, your part should look a little like that. So we have all the high detail of the stone part. We have the hairs, the individual hairs on the front part. Of course, this kind of texture is pretty hard to calculate, but that's why I chose that model. But you see, we have very good 3D data. We have very good textures. To show you a little bit more what I done as an example, I did a shoe here. I 3D scanned an Alpine star shoe. Like if you look here, you have all the details of the sole. You have the details of the little wrinkles and everything on there with high detailed texture maps. So that's basically it. With this technology, you are able to produce high quality 3D scans at home for free. So now that you have your 3D data, you can go ahead and 3D print them. But these ones are actually made with different 3D scanning technologies, from industrial over videogrammetry to photogrammetry. If you want to see how those compare to each other, watch my next video here.